Hello, and welcome to the Beijing Bienemann B2 IP webinar series hosted by Beijing Bienemann. I'm Peter Kiros, and today we have two presenters who will discuss drafting a common specification for U.S. and EPO practice. Our two panelists for today's webinar are my colleague, Chris Francis of Beach and Bienemann, and Sullivan Fountain of Kelty LLP, based out of the United Kingdom. Beach and Bienemann is a boutique intellectual property law firm based out of Southeast Michigan. Beach and Bienemann was established in 2012 and has expertise in preparing and prosecuting U.S. patent, copyright, and trademark matters. Beach and Bienemann has a national practice for your intellectual property needs. Kelty is a mid-sized London intellectual property boutique established in 1988 and now has a complement of over 100 staff. Kelty has a considerable range and depth of expertise on all aspects of UK, European and international IP protection and enforcement that includes over 40 professional staff and 14 partners and four offices. Partly due to the potential risks of the UK leaving the EU, one of these offices has been established in the thriving tech hub of Galway in the Republic of Ireland. Kelty has a high proportion of European and U.S.-based corporate clients with international interests across a range of sectors. In the middle of the presentation, we will announce a polling question that will show up on your screen. If you are seeking CLE credit, please be sure to answer the question before the presentation concludes. On your screen, you will find the Q&A and chat feature. Please leave all questions in either of these boxes, and we will answer them at the end. Thank you, and we hope you enjoy the presentation. And now, here are our presenters. Thank you, Peter. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Chris Francis of Bijan Bienemann, and it's my pleasure to be co-hosting this presentation with Sullivan Fountain, a, a, a European patent attorney from Kelty LLP. So the, the goal of our presentation today is to provide some background and some guidance and practical tips on drafting a common patent application for both U.S. and European practice. And so what do we mean exactly by a, a common patent application? Well, we're going to be discussing uh, some issues surrounding drafting a single description that maximizes claim scope in both jurisdictions by reducing pitfalls that, that might limit enforceability or claim scope in either jurisdiction, and at the same time, hopefully streamlining prosecution to reduce prosecution costs. So, of course, you know, none of us have a crystal ball, and we all know that when we're drafting a case today, it's difficult enough to try to forecast issues that might arise in potential enforcement over the next 20 years in our own single jurisdiction. You know, and that task becomes uh, even more difficult when drafting a single application for multiple jurisdictions. And so the materials uh, that we're going to discuss today do include some specific examples and practice tips, but perhaps the real takeaway is to help you issue spots so that you can be as proactive as possible to eliminate issues at the time of, of preparation in order to, to make prosecution flow more smoothly and hopefully get a better, better product at a reduced cost. So this slide here gives us a roadmap for the topics we're going to discuss. The first topic, which might be of particular interest to U.S. practitioners, um, is the EPO's approach regarding support. And Sullivan is going to take the lead on that discussion. And next, I'll steer a discussion on claim construction in the U.S. and with a special focus on, on statements in the specification that can be used to limit the scope of the claims during enforcement. And then Sullivan and I are, are going to discuss um, differences in, in, in um, uh, common practices in restriction practice and in subject uh, eligible uh, uh, patent eligible subject matter, and the patent eligible subject matter is going to really have a focus on, on software patents. Um, and I'll note at the outset here that the audience uh, does include both U.S. and European practitioners. So uh, different audience members might find you know, some of the slides more or less familiar, uh, depending on where you practice. But we're going to try to keep this moving and try to keep it engaging for, for everyone at, at all times. Um, if we go through a topic too quickly, um, there's going to be a question and answer session at the end. So if you, if you have a question, submit it at any time, and, and we'll, we'll cover all the questions at the end. Um, so moving on to the substance here, um, sometimes it appears to U.S. practitioners that that the requirement for support uh, is much more lenient in the U.S. PTO than in the EPO. And um, so this is kind of a topic I think that a lot of U.S. practitioners are, are interested in. So I'm going to pass it off to Sullivan, and, and he's going to walk us through this topic and, and how that ties into this concept of drafting a common specification. Okay, thanks, Chris. Uh, to echo Chris's comments earlier, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to our audience today. hope you'll find the content of this discussion useful. 
So one of the main differences between US and EP patent practice is in the way that documents are read and judged, and this applies to prior art, patent applications, and also priority documents. Um, it's well understood that the approach of the EPO in handling amendments is stricter than in other territories, particularly the USPTO. Compliance with uh, European Patent Convention Article 123 brackets 2 is the key here, and this article states that a European application may not be amended in such a way that it contains subject matter which extends beyond the application as filed. So far, so straightforward. But this requirement has been interpreted by case law over the years and has been given the meaning that all amendments must be shown to be directly and unambiguously derivable from the application as filed. This stems from the decisions of the enlarged Board of Appeal and so is the gold standard to which we are held during prosecution. The underlying idea of this provision is to ensure that an applicant should not be allowed to improve their position by added, adding subject matter which was not disclosed in the application as filed. The way in which the EPO assesses added, added subject matter has been a bugbear of users of the European patent system for many years, as it is generally viewed as an approach that is too strict. EPO examiners often require the application as filed to provide word-for-word -word basis if an amendment is to satisfy Article 123, brackets 2. Certainly, if verbatim support for amendments can be used for a desired amendment, then you can be confident that an amendment is on firm ground. Of course, it can be the case that verbatim support is just not there for an amendment that you want to make. So it's necessary to explain to the examiner where support is found and why that support is directly derivable. Convincing the examiner is one thing, but the strict requirement can introduce vulnerabilities to a case once it's granted. For example, added subject matter is one ground for attack in opposition. However, there's an apparent relaxation of this requirement following issuance of changes in the EPO guidelines for examination, which was occasioned by a recent G decision, G2 of 2010, and also through a symposium of EPO examiners and patent system practitioners. The new, guideline, the new guidelines provide the following guidance. I'll, I'll quote here from the official record of the, of the symposium. So, when assessing the conformity of the amended claims to the requirements of Article 1232, the focus should be placed on what is really disclosed to the skilled person by the documents as filed, as directed to a technical audience. In particular, the examiner should avoid disproportionately focusing on the structure of the claims as filed to the detriment of the subject matter that the skilled person would directly and unambiguously derive from the application as a whole. So, the general consensus here was that in assessing added matter, more consideration needs to be given to what the skilled person would actually understand from the whole disclosure of the application as filed, taking into account their common general knowledge in order to determine what is directly and unambiguously derivable from the application as filed. This takes a small step away from what was the perceived position that the directly and unambiguously derivable test had morphed into almost a literal assessment. So the new guidelines are welcomed as they suggest examiners may allow amendments to be made for combinations of features that are not literally supported by the applications filed, but nonetheless are obvious from its whole disclosure. This comes with a health warning, of course, that it's easier to talk about these issues in theory than to prove in practice, but it seems to be a welcome step in the right direction. In addition to the formal requirements for the amendments of the description, it's also worth bearing in mind that the EPC rules, this is specifically rule 137 brackets 4, makes it mandatory for applicants to indicate basis in the application as filed for any amendments made. So this means that the amendment must be described clearly in, res in a response letter and the support for the amendment must also be provided. So just a general reference to a, to a page number is not usually sufficient. Rather, um, a, a full description of where of the page and the paragraph and line number where support can be found should be provided often accompanied by a full description of how that support is found. A couple of tips then to help with the amendment process. If fallback positions are not already in the dependent claims, try and include fallback positions in the specification that closely support potential amendments in the future. Amendments generally are not allowed if those features only appear in the drawings. Therefore, from a US perspective, it would be worthwhile adding some discussion in the specification if interconnections shown only in the drawings might be useful for amendments. And note here that the abstract or any documents that are incorporated by reference are not considered to be part of the application as filed. So careful consideration of such references are recommended if it's envisaged that you might need to rely on such documents for amend amendment in future prosecution. So moving on to the next slide. 
see if I can get the slide pack to work. Moving on to the next slide now, and uh, a brief discussion about uh, support for priority. So the EPO's approach to requiring good support for amendments is also reflected in the requirements for claiming priority. Article 87 of the European Patent Convention, which affects Article 4 of the Paris Convention, states that any person who has filed a patent application shall enjoy a right of priority in respect of the same invention. So these, prov these provisions enable a patent application to claim priority from an earlier patent application so long as the priority claiming application relates to the same invention. The EPO applies a strict interpretation as to what constitutes the same invention, which was established by a decision of the Enlarged Board of Appeal, um, G2 of 98. This states that only subject matter that a skilled person might directly and unambiguous, unambiguously derivable, there's that test again, from the disclosure of the priority application can be considered to be the same invention. The risk here then is that a priority claiming application that, the, that has claims that are newly introduced or broadened or even amended as compared to an earlier priority application um, may not be entitled to the priority date which is being claimed. So, a very brief disclosure serving as a priority document, for example, as may be created by way of a US provisional, has inherent risk in terms of serving as a valid priority right. Nonetheless, it's a practical reality that provisional style priority applications are sometimes needed, but they should be used with care and with full knowledge of the risks. The inherent risk can be mitigated by incorporating language in the so-called claimless priority filing that resembles future claim language as close as possible. And it should also discuss alternative embodiments and different levels of generalization. Furthermore, a provisional filing should ideally be followed up by a fuller filing as soon as possible should, to ensure a full disclosure. Another pitfall worthy of note here is the issue of failing to ensure that the priority claiming application claims priority to the first disclosure of the invention. This problem may arise in larger patent families with overlapping content, as it's sometimes found uh, where there may be several continuation in part applications or a number of provisional applications with similar and overlapping content. Priority must be claimed back to the first application in which, in which the claimed subject matter is disclosed. It would also be worth covering here the subject of entitlement to priority. The best practice in Europe is to ensure that a priority assigning agreement is prepared and executed by all parties prior to the filing of a priority claiming application. This is to ensure that a valid transfer of the priority application and the right to claim priority has taken place before the time of the later application. The important message is, the, is that the entire set of applicants in the later application own the whole of the priority application, or at least the right to claim priority. The safest position is where there is an identity of applicants at the time of filing the later application. So, and that concludes um, the discussion on priority. And I'll now turn to the next slide. Uh, which uh, backs things up somewhat to dra drafting principles, and particularly this issue of intermediate generalizations. So in slide three, we discuss the need to provide clear support for the amendments that we make to the claims and how the EPO examiners tend to apply the relevant rules strictly. In addition to assuring that the amended claim language is supported, these requirements can often cause a problem to amendments which are taken from the specification, rather than simply being a combination of existing claim features. This is particularly the case where a proposed amendment attempts to pick a particular feature from a specific embodiment without including other features that are associated with it. Such an amendment would likely to be fairly uncontroversial in the US as the specification tends to be treated more like a reservoir of words from which a US attorney can pick various features from the text or the drawings to derive a desired amendment. Before the EPO though, this type of amendment is usually known as uh, an intermediate generalization and is considered to be an undisclosed combination of selected features lying somewhere between originally a broad disclosure and a more limited specific disclosure. In principle, such an intermediate generalization is contrary to Article 123 brackets 2 as it was not disclosed clearly and unambiguously in the application as filed. Examiners tend to be alert to situations where an attempt is made to amend a claim to include a feature that is disclosed in the description only with respect to a particular embodiment and use that feature in isolation without including other features associated with it. However, such an approach may be allowed if it can be shown, firstly, that those features are, se are separable and not inextricably linked, as it were, 
and two, that the overall disclosure justifies the generalizing isolation of the feature and its introduction into the claim. Um, a case that provides a useful illustration of this uh, is a Technical Board of Appeal Decision T219 of 09. And there's a couple of uh, images here that show you a quick overview of what we're talking about. Um, the invention was a trekking stick, you can see the handle here, um, with an inbuilt shock absorber. A grip member included a shock absorbing mechanism, that'll be a spring, and that could be activated and deactivated by twisting the grip so as to engage a pin with a slot. In the specific embodiment, as shown here in the drawings, two slots are arranged in an inverted L shape, and a cam is provided in the upper end of the slot. Uh, the cam is uh, integer 15. And this cam separates the two parts of the inverted L so that the grip member must be lowered and twisted to move the pin beyond the cam to activate the shock absorber. During prosecution, the applicant attempted to limit claim one to focus on the feature of the cam that allowed the grip member to flick between on and off positions and to releasably lock into these positions. Claim one was amended to include cam means provided in at least one slot, which is arranged to prevent the pin member from freely sliding from the first region to the second region. However, this amendment was found to be objectionable as an intermediate generalization. The reason for this was that the term CAM means, or even more simply just CAM, is a generalized form of what was described in the specification. The patent did not actually claim a specifically shaped slot, and neither did it discuss any other specifically shaped slots, except in the context of the CAM. Also, a CAM was not originally claimed, so the inclusion of the CAM feature was lifted directly from the specification but stripped of the other features that related to the CAM, namely the L-shaped slot. Therefore, the amended claim was con considered to cover a wide variety of CAM mechanisms with any number of slots of various shapes. So the board found no indication that other features discussed with the CAM, like the inverted L-shaped slots, slots, might somehow be incidental to the on-off mechanism's proper functioning and could therefore be omitted or modified without consequences for the CAM and its arrangement. Because of this, the board concluded that the amendment was not admissible. This issue could have been avoided with a general discussion within the specification of the function of the CAM means with respect to the slot, and also by emphasizing that the CAM may not have been crucial to the proper functioning of the slot. This case emphasizes the strict approach taken by the EPO, but it also triggers thinking about how such risks might have been mitigated at the drafting stage. A recent decision by the UK courts, however, suggests that the approach under UK law is a little more tolerant. Um, no pictures here, but uh, just to give you an overview, in, in a case called AP Racing versus Alcon Components, the invention concerned high-performance brake calipers. A key feature of the brake calipers was the so-called peripheral stiffening bands, the purpose of which was to extend around the caliper body and to resist bending moments during braking. The strengthened calipers use less material, and were therefore lighter and reduced unsprung mass, all very useful attributes for a brake caliper. The embodiment in the specification as filed described the caliper body as including a J-shaped or hockey stick-shaped peripheral stiffening band. However, the granted claim, as amended during prosecution, referred to stiffening bands which had a profile that was, quote, asymmetric about the lateral axis of the body when viewed in plan. So quite a, a generalized position. In the first instance proceedings, the claims were held to be invalid as the application as originally filed only taught peripheral stiffening bands with a specific configuration, which was necessarily asymmetrical, and so it did not teach a particular generalization of stiffening bands having a generally asymmetrical appearance. On appeal, however, the Court of Appeal reversed the decision. It held that the application as filed disclosed a particular class of embodiments having peripheral stiffening bands which were necessarily asymmetric about a lateral axis. So the claim recitation that the bands had a profile that was asymmetric about a lateral axis of the body when viewed in plan did not provide the skilled person with any further information which he would not have obtained from the application as originally filed. The court explained that there was no blanket prohibition to the addition of claim features which define in more generalized terms features described in the specification so long as those features do not disclose new information about the invention. So this case illustrates that the UK courts appear to apply more liberal tests. So some practical advice. Take care when drafting independent claims to ensure that all significant features are included in the original claim set. 
if the number of claims are a consideration, um, claim style statements can be included in the summary section. Um, the summary of the invention section can be a useful part of the specification to define each feature broadly and how it may be combinable with other features of the specific embodiments. And be alert to features of a particular embodiment of the invention that may be different to other specific embodiments and critique these carefully. Is their purpose um, inextricably linked to other features of that embodiment? And can they be combined with different embodiments? If they're not inextricably linked with each other, say so. A single specific embodiment described in the application is a risk in circumstances where the more general claims need to be limited to features disclosed only in the specification. So where possible, include discussion of more than one embodiment. At this point, I'll hand the baton back over to Chris for a brief wrap up on drafting takeaways. Uh, thanks, Sullivan. Um, I'm actually gonna, gonna move on to the, um, the, the, ne the next slide here. Um, uh, I, I think this slide kind of ties in a bit with what Sullivan was just talking about. Um, and it talks about claim strategy and strategy for multiple dependent claims and, and how to get them in um, with full support, um, you know, depending on which, which country you're going to file in first and what the originating application is. And so um, I, I think it'll be clear from this slide that it's beneficial to, to draft the entire claim set for all jurisdictions at the time of drafting the original application uh, so that um, you can describe all the different claims um, in the description of that common application to kind of avoid some of these pitfalls that, that Sullivan just walked through. Um, so there are a few things that can, can lead to, to uh, different claim sets for the different jurisdictions at the time of filing, and, and I think you know, the, the one major distinction between the U.S. and most jurisdictions is that it is very uncommon to file a U.S. application with multiple dependent claims, and this is mostly due to cost. I mean, first, there's a, a surcharge uh, merely for having multiple dependent claims, um, and that surcharge is 820 U.S. dollars, or about 600, 680 euros. Um, and second, each multiple dependent claim counts as more than one claim. So in the U.S., the filing fee gets you 20 claims, and there's a per claim fee for every claim over 20. And a multiple dependent claim counts as the total number of claims from which it directly depends. And so this can quickly add up and, and take you over 20 claims and into that excess claim fee territory. Uh, but um, there, there are very big benefits in, in many jurisdictions, including Europe, um, to uh, including multiple dependent claims. So. This slide kind of shows you some, some basic strategy on, on, uh, based on where the first filing is. Um, so the first bullet, um, if uh, under the strategy uh, bullet point there is, um, you know, if the, if the application is an EPO originating application, well, this is pretty easy, right? I mean, obviously you're gonna file a multiple dependent claim set um, at the time of filing in the EPO, and then later when you come into the US, you can remove those multiple dependent claims at the time of filing, usually by way of preliminary amendment, and you avoid the, the, the fees associated with multiple dependent claims that way. Um, now, if the originating application is a U.S. provisional application, um, well, th this is also a pretty pretty easy example. Um, you know, that, that application is never going to be substantively reviewed by the USPTO, and it's not subject to any sort of claim fees, much less excess claim fees. So it makes sense to include your multiple dependent claims there in that U.S. provisional, and then obviously you take them out when you're filing your U.S. utility and you leave them in uh, for the European application, and the obvious advantage there is then that the, the U.S. provisional application is going to uh, provide verbatim support for that multiple dependent claim set in the European application. And there's not really a, a detrimental effect in the, the corresponding U.S. utility application. And you can also use a similar strategy when the originating application is a PCT application, uh, but just be wary of which office you choose as the international searching authority. One catch here is that um, the USPTO will review, uh, if the USPTO is acting as the ISA, they will review multiple dependent claims, but they will not review multiple dependent claims that are dependent on other multiple dependent claims. And so that's a practice that you're going to want to avoid if, if you're choosing uh, the USPTO as your international searching authority. And so the first two bullet points, um, it, it's, it's pretty easy to see how you provide support for the multiple dependent claims in the originating application. 
Um, but it can be a little bit trickier um, when, when you're first filing your application as a U.S. utility. They, as I said, want to avoid the multiple dependent claims in the U.S. claim set, but we want to provide support for uh, the European claim set and the multiple dependent claims in, in Europe. So um, somewhere in the detailed description, perhaps at the very beginning or perhaps at the very end, it can be beneficial to include paragraphs that include the EPO claim set, including all the multiple dependency. And so an example of how you would do that is, in addition to your, your normal detailed description, not changing anything there, just in addition to it, you can include a copy of your EPO claim set uh, by pasting every claim into the detailed description in its own section and list each claim as having its own paragraph number. And then you can tie the multiple dependency together um, using those paragraph numbers. And then that can provide you the, the obvious benefit of providing support for the later, U, the, the, the later EPO application. Um, and then one last point here um, on claim strategy. It, it's useful to, to understand the, the fee structure in the different jurisdictions to avoid excess government claim fees. Um, as I said a few minutes ago, the filing fee in the USPTO gets you 20 claims, but the filing fee uh, only gets you 15 claims in the EPO. So, uh, for example, if you file your 20 claim U.S. set uh, in the EPO, uh, it's going to cost you an extra 1400 U.S. dollars just in, in government fees. So it's obviously beneficial to trim your claim set down to 15. Um, and on that point, I mean, for other jurisdictions, you might even be trimming it down significantly more. Um, but again, it, it's useful to prepare that claim set at the time of preparing the application. Um, for example, if you choose to combine some claims in the U.S. case to get it down to 15 in Europe, it might be beneficial to have that combination uh, and perhaps other relevant combinations properly described in your detailed description for the benefit of that EPO application um, to address exactly the issues that, that Sullivan just walked through. And then finally, when you trim down those claims, um, you're going to want to consider restriction practice as well in the U.S. and in Europe, and, and Sullivan and I are going to talk about uh, that in, in a, a little while. So moving on to some more U.S.-specific uh, topics um, for, for, uh, for, for, for U.S. practice, um, this next group of slides are dedicated uh, toward U.S. claim construction based on, on language um, in the claims and language in the specification as a whole. And so the first few slides um, are going to discuss statements in the description that um, some refer to as patent profanity, um, and then that's followed by slides uh, that discuss strategies for background and summary sections, and followed by slides um, uh, with recent developments in means plus function limitations in the U.S. and how they can be avoided, um, or conversely, how they can be leveraged to your benefit. So this slide is just a really quick background to set the stage for, for terms in the specification that, that have been called patent profanity. So um, examples of patent profanity just at the outset here include, you know, describing something as the invention in the detailed description or describing something as required or maybe even preferable. These are all terms in the specification that can limit the scope of the claims, often unintentionally by the drafter. Um, so as U.S. practitioners are well aware, um, in 2005, there's a, a federal circuit case called Phillips, and in that case, um, the, the federal circuit uh, laid out that a claim term is given its plain and ordinary meaning in the light of the specification. Um, but the court also noted that there, there are a few exceptions in which it is proper to meaning. One exception is when a drafter is his or her own lexicographer, and this occurs basically when a, when a drafter provides a, a clear definition of a term in the detailed description that deviates from the plain and ordinary meaning. And the other exception um, that allows for a deviation from the plain and ordinary meaning is when the patentee disavows claim scope, and disavowal occurs when, when a detailed description makes it clear that that term does not include a particular feature or definition. So these cases provide the groundwork. You'll see that these cases on this slide are all relatively old from the early and, and mid-2000s, uh, but there are plenty of more recent examples that, that we'll talk about in the upcoming slides. Um, so here's a, a relatively recent example. It's from 2014. Um, the fact pattern of this case is a, is a bit complicated and the claims are, are long, 
um, so I don't reproduce them here. But uh, one of the claims at issue uses the claim term electrode. And so the patentee con contended um, that the term electrode should be given as plain and ordinary meaning under the Phillips case. In other words, not just the specific type of electrode described in the description, but more broadly, uh, any type of electrode, including you know, uh, just a single conductor. Um, and so Intel, on the other hand, argued that the claim term electrode should be construed to have the specific sandwich configuration that was described in the detailed description. So the detailed description described um, th this, this sandwich configuration um, in which um, three electrodes were sandwiched together. And the court agreed with Intel, and they said that the term electrode in the claim is limited to the specific sandwich configuration uh, based on disavowal. And the court said, look, disavowal was clear here because the specification stated that this sandwich configuration is, quote, universal to all embodiments, unquote. And, and another quote is, they said that an essential element among all embodiments or connotations of the invention is this sandwich con uh, con configuration. Um, so the, the takeaway here is that unless a European practitioner has reason to believe that, that this type of language um, is going to be extremely important to uh, gaining patent protection in Europe, these types of statements that an element is essential, a requirement, uh, a requirement or, or is needed, um, those types of terms should, should really be avoided in a, in a common specification in anticipation of, of filing in the U.S. And here's another example, uh, kind of related but, but, but different. Um, this one also was recent from 2013, and the, the claim here claims a first disk and a second disk. And the university, the, the patent holder, asserted that the plain and ordinary meaning of the first disk being affixed to the second disk includes two disks that are integrally formed together as a unitary piece. But the court here said that the, the patentee actually disavowed that unitary piece uh, claim scope because the detailed description said that, quote, the invention is a two-piece configuration. Um, and there are a lot of cases like this that, that talk about the invention and describing something as the invention and, and being uh, limiting uh, to the claim scope. So again, for, for U.S. purposes, uh, a common specification should avoid the words uh, uh, the invention. Uh, and I think this really just comes down to wordsmithing. Um, it's, it's easy enough to avoid using the word the invention and, and perhaps still get across to the point that you're trying to get across. And finally, the last bullet point here is just a quick plug for our firm's blog. Um, this is another relevant district court case that we discussed on our blog a couple months ago. Um, it was another case of disavowal based on the use of the words the invention. Um, and on that note, um, I just wanted to get in that we do have two separate blogs, both accessible on our Bijan Bienemann website. One is called the SWIFT Report. And that's got a primary focus on software-related patent issues. And the other one is called the Claims Interpreted Report. And that focuses on, on claim construction decisions in uh, U.S. ex parte appeals and inter parte reviews, district court cases, and federal circuit cases. So moving on, um, wrapping this issue up here, um, this GE lighting case I think is a good one to quickly talk about. Um, in this case, there was no disavowal. But the court gives us this nice list of words that, that we should probably be avoiding in a common specification in anticipation of filing into the U.S. Um, and then the court contrasts that list with um, the fact pattern of the case and provides actually some examples of good practice in which um, the court looked at as avoiding disavowal. And so um, the, the, the claim term here at issue was an IDC connector. And the court said, you know, here's some things that avoided disavowal. The specification consistently referred to the IDC connector shown in the figure as merely a depicted embodiment. That's a quote, depicted embodiment. Um, and there are, are two important points here. Um, the description makes it clear that the connector is just an example. It's not a preferred example. It's not a required example. It's just a, an example. And uh, perhaps just as important, they noted that the detailed description is consistent on this point, so there's no ambiguity. Um, and there was also no use of interchangeable, um, there was no interchangeable use of, of words that might create a, some sort of ambiguity about what's a requirement and what's not, and what's an example and what's not. And um, finally, the, the court noted that there's no description of the invention or anything being essential or important 
Um, and actually, one final point, they also mentioned that there's no disparaging uh, comments in, uh, about alternative IDC connectors, and we'll talk about disparaging comments in a few slides. Um, but basically, this slide just gives you a nice roadmap of, of what to avoid and, and what to embrace in U.S. practice. Um, and I know Sullivan has some thoughts on, on this practice as well in, in Europe um, and how it plays out in the EPO, so I'll pass it off to Sullivan for, for some comments on that. Okay, thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, so patent profanity has become somewhat of a hot topic, and uh, while I understand the issues, I think there's a risk that drafting techniques designed to avoid so-called profanity words can, in, in more extreme circumstances, lead to patent specification that have somewhat of a bland character, uh, which say little about the purpose of the invention and the problem it sets out to solve, uh, include scant discussion about the advantages the invention confers, and only refer to embodiments, uh, and includes no discussion of preferred but optional features that may provide useful fallback positions. Um, in my view, it's important to strike the right balance, really. Words that clearly relinquish claim scope and introduce specific definitions of the claimed subject matter at the filing stage should obviously be looked at very carefully. And the use of the word preferably shouldn't be used simply to flag another embodiment of the invention in the description. Rather, it should really only be used where there are identifiable advantages associated with that particular preference. However, I think that the simple absence of possibly controversial words is not a cure-all approach that will enable the correct claim scope to be obtained. Um, most court decisions in this area don't simply um, labour on the presence of certain words, but rather provide um, a detailed technical analysis of the subject matter disclosed in the patent applicant specification. For me, it really comes back to good drafting practices that include providing a detailed technical anal analysis at the time of filing and disclosure, making sure that at least one definition of the invention with the correct level of generality is included in the initial filing, and together with a series of generalized fallback positions that can be used as required during prosecution or litigation. The inclusion of features in the specification that are not essential to the invention, uh, or which may be oversold as essential, or the lack of generalizations of intermediate scope between specific embodiment and the broad inventive concept, I believe, are more significant issues that would make a bumpy road for claims to be granted with the desired scope, or that will cause undesirably narrow interpretation of claim, claim terms. Um, implications such that a particular feature is essential or necessary or critical or must be present should also be avoided where possible. Uh, it's accepted now that such words can cause problems from a US perspective, but in Europe too they can cause issues during, during prosecution. And one instance of this is where a feature of an independent claim is sought to be removed during the examination procedure perhaps to be replaced by a different feature. Examiners will generally object to such an approach because uh, the independent claim features are supposed to be the essential definition of the invention. However, if it can be shown that the feature sought to be removed was not explained as essential in the disclosure, it was not indispensable for the function of the invention in light of the technical problem to be solved, and that the removal requires no real modification of other features, then it might be possible to affect such a change in the claim. Um, so that, that really concludes the discussion on patent profanity. So I'll um, hand back to Chris for a, a brief rundown on issues with the uh, summary and background sections. Yeah, thanks, Alvin. And uh, before we uh, before we get to that, um, we'll take a, a quick break here for the purposes of CLE credit. Um, we've got our polling question here. Um, so the, the question is, uh, in what state is Bijan Biedemann located? The answer is Michigan. Um, so uh, for anyone seeking CLE credits, uh, between now and the end of the presentation, um, send the word Michigan to us through the, uh, the teleconference interface, and uh, we'll record that for the CLE purposes. Um, so moving on to the substance again, um, we'll, we'll do a, a kind of a quick discussion here of, of the background and the summary. Um, these are, are so the background is covered on this slide, and, and some thoughts on the summary are, are discussed on a uh, following slide. Um, these are, are both sections of the specification that can also be used to limit the scope of, of U.S. claims. Um, this is one of those areas where perhaps you can find some competing interest between the U.S. PTO practice and the EPO practice. Uh, many U.S. practitioners have migrated toward very thin backgrounds um, because the, the background is admitted prior art, and so the more that you say in the background, the easier it is for a U.S. examiner to cobble together an obviousness rejection. 
And so a consideration in drafting the background uh, in an effort to aid the problem solution approach in the European prosecution while also avoiding saying too much uh, for U.S. prosecution for obviousness purposes uh, is to focus the attention of the background on setting up the problem while avoiding a, a thorough description of the prior art itself and avoiding identifying prior art patents and publications by number in the background. Um, those are, are some things that can, can help you, I think, in, in the U.S. and, and uh, perhaps um, can be tied in um, kind of with a common practice in, in uh, preparing for the EPO application as well. Um, on that note, there are three cases listed here. Um, and they're examples of uh, cases where the applicant characterized or disparaged the prior art, and the court used those disparaging comments to deviate from the plain and ordinary meaning of the terms to, to limit the, the scope of the claims. Um, so I, th I think in summary here, you know, there, there is uh, uh, less of a bright line rule here when attempting to, to draft a common specification, but these are, are just some issues to spot and to think about um, and so you can use your best judgment when you're preparing that, that common application. And then moving on to some considerations for the summary. Um, and with respect to the summary, I think it, it might be easier to reach a middle ground that satisfies um, a lot of issues in, in both the EPO and the USPTO. The USPTO procedures make it clear that the summary is optional altogether. So it might even make sense if you're only filing in the U.S. to omit the summary altogether. Uh, however, this type of practice can create some difficulties in a corresponding EPO application. Um, so, you know, a, a, as Sullivan discussed a, a few minutes ago, a well-written summary can have real advantages in the EPO. In my opinion, the, the summary just needs to be drafted with an eye toward U.S. practice. For example, discussing the claim language at a high level, like uh, Sullivan discussed with the intermediate generalization rule, and uh, erring on the side of, of presenting this language as examples and avoiding the disavowal issues that we discussed above and, and so on. And, and finally, since courts are, are also, they, they, in the U.S., they seem tempted to be able to, to, to give special importance to text that's labeled as a summary. I think it's a good idea to, to remove the summary heading in the U.S. filing and perhaps instead just place that text as um, the beginning of the detailed description, uh, perhaps under the, the heading of introduction. So another topic that's, that's worth discussing um, in, that's, that's driven by U.S. practice is the use of the word means in the claim. So in the U.S., the, the use of the word means followed by a function invokes our section 112F. And when 112F is invoked, its effect is that the claim uh, term means, the word means, incorporates the corresponding embodiments disclosed in the specification and equivalents. Uh, so for infringement of a means plus function clause, the accused product must do two things. It must perform the claim function described in the claim, and it must perform that function with the structure that's disclosed in the specification or an equivalent structure. So you know, in, in layman's terms, essentially you're limiting your, your claim to the structure described in your specification. In the U.S., using the word means in the claim, uh, the, the word means by itself creates a, a uh, the word means followed by function creates a, a rebuttable presumption that 112F is invoked, and that's a very tough presumption to overcome. So you only want to use means followed by functions if, if you're actually intending to invoke 112F. Now, this Williamson case that's discussed on this slide from 2015 adds in uh, another interesting layer. Uh, that case makes it clear that 112F can be invoked uh, when using a substitute word for means, and the, the court calls these substitute words nonce words. And there are some examples here of, of, of nonce words. In the Williamson case, for example, the claim recited a module that performs a function, and the court held that, that this language um, that's quoted right here on the slide did, in fact, invoke 112F. So for U.S. practice, the, the first question is really whether you wish to invoke 112F or not. So over the last few decades, this language of means plus function language has, has largely fallen out of favor. But you should really consider whether it makes sense to embrace 112F in certain situations. 
since you get three independent claims in the U.S. before excess claim fees apply, and you can have independent claims of varying scope toward the same invention, as we'll be talking about in a few minutes, it, it may be worthwhile to consider adding a means plus function claim in as a third independent claim. For example, in, in the current atmosphere with inter parte reviews, a means plus function claim may be narrowly construed to your benefit to avoid institution of an IPR on that claim. So if you are trying to evoke 112F, use the, the, the term means followed by function. But if you're not trying to invoke 112F, you really have to be cautious with the use of functional language, especially if you're using it after something that could be considered a nonce word under that Williamson case. And to the degree that you, you think you might, uh, that, that, that your claim language might be getting a little close to the outcome in Williamson, you really want to make sure that, that you're including significant detail about features of that means in your detailed description, enough so that you're enabling the invention and satisfying the written description requirements in the U.S. Um, so that wraps up the U.S. discussion of means, and I know Sullivan has some, some thoughts on, on this as well, on how the word means plays out in the EPO, so I'll, I'll pass it off to Sullivan. Okay, thanks, Chris. So Chris went over the, uh, the issues relating to Section 112, um, and that cautions us against using means plus function language in the U.S. claims, even when the word means is not actually used. There is no similar provision in the Articles and Rules of the European Patent Convention, uh, and the use of such language is generally an advantage in Europe. Commonly, we'll see this claim structure in an EP application, particularly those prepared originally on um, main, mainland Europe, for example, and sort of German and uh, French colleagues. Um, however, a health warning here is that there can be no negative consequences to using uh, means plus function language claims in EP applications that may come into being during prosecution or later during litigation. For example, an objection to lack of support in the description can result if the description only discloses a specific means, whereas the claim scope is far broader. Um, such a feature may also be objectionable uh, as attempting to define the invention as a result to be achieved. And this is particularly the case if the examiner is of the opinion that the claim merely claims the underlying technical problem. So, whilst mean plus function lang claim language is generally okay in Europe, um, it should be used with caution as only, and only as part of a well-drafted specific description that explains alternatives for any elements claimed in means plus function language. From a US perspective, it may be helpful again to include a European claim set which is drafted in means plus function format to maximize opportunities for European prosecution. Such a claim set could be included at the end of the specification or even in the summary of invention section uh, as a set of clauses. So that wraps up the uh, means plus function section of the, the talk today. Um, and now we'll re move on to a couple of slides to discuss restriction practice in Unity. Um, so the way the USPTO and the EPO approach the number of independent claims in an application um, also is a, a bit of a differentiator. Uh, in the US, generally is permitted to have more than one independent claim of the same type in a claim set. Um, and sometimes this can be taken to the extreme with, with 10 or so different independent claims all being slightly different in scope. Um, yeah, this is a useful strat strategic tool from a patentee's perspective, uh, but can create uh, significant uncertainty from the point of view of businesses attempted to, uh, to, to understand what the, what's the covered claim scope. And before the EPO, more than one independent claim is typically allowed where those claims relate to different types of you know, claim category, for example, different pro uh, products, processes, apparatus or uses. However, it's important to note that each independent claim must conform with the EPO unity requirements and must therefore have the same special technical features and so relate to the same invention. Um, the existence of multiple independent claims in the same category is looked at carefully uh, and will only be allowed if the claims relate to one of a few specific scenarios. These are set out by um, the EPC Rule 43. Um, so, so the specific scenarios are a plurality of interrelated products, uh, different uses of a product or apparatus or alternative solutions to a particular problem where those solutions cannot be covered by a single claim. From an ideal point of view then, uh, during preparation of the originating US patent application, some thought should be given to these issues in preparation for later prosecution of the application in Europe. Um, for example, um, an EP specific claim set can be prepared with suitable independent claims and also including multiple dependencies. Um, 
and this claim set can be included as part of the description, as we mentioned earlier. Um, the ordering of claims is also an important consideration in Europe, as there is less flexibility in electing a particular claim species to be searched. Uh, the EPO will focus on the first invention uh, appearing in the claims and invite payment of further search fees or filing of a divisional application. So it's recommended that some thought should be given to the claim ordering on entry into the EP regional phase um, if there is a priority order to the claim set. In many instances, uh, a European patent application will have two independent claims, an apparatus claim and a method claim. Um, the apparatus claim and the method claim should be as broad and generic as reasonably possible and encompass all desired embodiments of the invention. The single apparatus claim and method claim will likely satisfy not only Rule 43.2 EPC, but also the unity of invention requirements through recitation of common special technical features. Um, so just on the restrictions side, I'll hand back to Chris for a brief overview um, from a US perspective. Yeah, thanks, Sullivan. And um, we, we are, uh, we're running a little bit over, so I'm gonna give a, a brief discussion of the of the restriction practice in the U.S., uh, but I'm going to cut it down a bit so that we have plenty of time for our discussion of patent eligible subject matter because I think we have some, some good materials to cover in there. So I'll just quickly say about USPTO practice. Um, as Sullivan noted, you, you can have multiple independent claims of varying scope directed at the same invention. Um, and under USPTO rules, a, a restriction is proper when the claims are directed toward independent and distinct inventions, and there would be a serious burden on the examiner if, if restriction is not required. So there are a couple of requirements there that the examiner has to, to satisfy in order to properly give you a restriction. Uh, practically speaking, you know, if an independent claim, uh, if two independent claims have, have varying scope from each other or are even directed toward an assembly and a sub-assembly, um, those claims might be examined together if they include, for example, the same novel feature and perhaps some, some of the similar supporting structure under the assumption um, that uh, there's no serious burden on the examiner to search all the independent claims at once. So to kind of say it in another way, to summarize that, um, m multiple independent claims of varying scope toward the same invention should not be restricted, but independent claims toward different inventions will be restricted. And when it comes to independent method and apparatus claims, it is also possible to, to have those two types of claims in the same application in the US. Um, however, those claims are going to be restricted in instances where the method can be practiced with an apparatus different than the apparatus of the independent claim, or conversely, if the apparatus can be used in a method that is materially different than the claimed method. So those are some instances where, where you will uh, get a restriction. And then um, here are some practice pointers that Sullivan and I wanted to, to get down in writing. I think we've pretty much covered all of them already, but they're here for, for your future use um, in this slide. And then uh, we'll get on to patent eligible subject matter. Um, Sullivan's gonna, gonna kick us off on this one with the EPO discussion, and then after that, I'm gonna get into a compare and contrast with the USPTO. So I'll, I'll pass it off to Sullivan now. Okay, thanks, Chris. Um, so we're now in the uh, final straight. So we'll move on to the final few slides in the deck. Uh, and these provide an overview of soft, software subject matter issues in the US and Europe. Um, <clears throat> so, Article 52, European Patent Convention, states that computer programs as such are not inventions. But this is not a total prohibition on computer and software related inventions. Um, those two words as such have uh, caused a lot of problems over the years, uh, and a body of case law has developed since the start of the EPC, which provides guidance as to where the line stands between what is and what is not patentable, patentable when it comes to software. Although there is no definition of the term invention in the EPC, it's generally understood that invention should have a technical character. For example, methods of controlling an industrial process, processing of uh, data representing physical entities, um, sort of temperature, size, shape, things like that, and the internal functions of the computer itself are considered to have a technical character in general. A computer system used in the field of finance may have a technical character if the process is based on technical considerations relating to how a computer works. Uh, improvement of security and things like that. 
um, rather than just on, on the consideration as to how the financial um, uh, side of things work. The way uh, computer implemented inventions or software inventions are handled in the U USPTO in Europe are a little different, but there does appear to be some convergence, particularly more recently. Uh, before the USPTO, the eligibility hurdle is given prominence and serves to knock out any claim that does not involve something that is considered an invention. However, before the EPO, the process for considering the patentability of computer implemented inventions has shifted away from the eligibility hurdle towards the inventive step hurdle. Um, therefore, a claim will not be refused as purely software or purely a business method if it contains at least one technical feature. That could be just a computing unit of some description. Uh, this is sometimes referred to as the any hardware approach. However, once over the relatively low eligibility hurdle, the problem then comes with the inventive step assessment. In effect, the EPO asks the question uh, of, of whether those features that contribute to the technical character of the invention provide a non-obvious solution to a technical problem. So, um, it is the inventive step itself that needs to be a technical one, not one that's driven by other non-technical factors such as business considerations. One particular challenge comes with software implemented business methods, as it can be virtually impossible to formulate a technical problem that has its foundations in the field of endeavour of the application. In such cases, um, technical aspects may come into play with the implementation of the non-technical idea. I'll go into this in a bit more detail. Um, indeed, the EPO essentially cons considers the question to be, uh, given a business method, which may in itself be novel and have a useful effect, although this is ignored by the EPO for this purpose, um, would the skilled person, for example a software developer, tasked with implementing this business method, arrive at the invention by doing his or her routine work and with knowledge of the prior art. Therefore, in order to address this objection, it would need to be argued that, firstly, that some of the features that the examiner has deemed to be non-technical are in fact technical, i.e. they have a technical effect that goes beyond the business aim of the method, or are they inextricably linked to the technical features? And secondly, even if the skilled person was told to implement the administrative and business method described, he or she would not necessarily arrive at the present implementation without an inventive step. So a useful approach in such a situation of these mixed type invention um, of technical and non-technical features is to be able to argue that the claim includes implementation features which are not straightforward technical implementation steps that the skilled person would take, despite them being given the non-technical business objective that has been identified by the examiner. Um, a, an example of this approach is provided in the um, EPO examination guidelines, um, and this sets out a few case studies around, around this type of thing. And one of these in, in particular is fairly useful in my view, and it's worth going into a little more detail in how the EPO considers these mixed type inventions. So at this point, I'll move on to the next slide. Okay, not too far. Okay, so uh, the claim in this case study relates to a computerized shopping method, uh, which provides an, a user interface that outputs an optimal shopping tour around a set of vendors in a location based on a user selection of two or more products to be purchased. So at a high level, it sounds very, so it has a, quite a business method feel to it. So you can see the, uh, the claim features there, and I'll, I'll, I won't uh, go through those in detail just to save a bit of time here. Um, so in, in examining this claim, firstly, the features that con uh, contribute to the technical character of the invention are identified. Effectively, this is the distributed system comprising a mobile device connected to a server computer, which has a cache memory and is connected to the database, so all pretty standard components. Then the prior art is considered. In this case, the closest prior art document, that's term D1, uh, disclosed a method for facilitating shopping on a mobile device wherein the user selects a single product and the server determines from a database the vendor selling the selected product nearest to the user and transmits this information to the user's mobile device. Having established this closest prior art background, then the differences between the closest prior art document and the claim concept are determined. So here the differences are firstly that the user can select two or more products to purchase instead of a single product only. Two, that an optimal shopping tour for purchasing the two or more products is provided to the user. And three, um, that the optimal shopping tour is determined by the server by accessing a cache memory in which optimal shopping tours determined for previous requests are stored. 
So once the differences are determined, uh, are identified, sorry, a determination is made about which are technical. So I think the first two differences serve no technical purpose. Um, they're simply business processes, and so they cannot be considered to provide a technical contribution. It's just a user input um, and provision of data back to the user. Feature three, though, is a little different. First glance, it appears to be rather mundane, um, and here it could be argued that it relates to the technical, but it could be argued that it relates to the technical implementation of the first two differences, and provides a technical effect of rapid determination of an optimal shopping tour by accessing previous requests stored in the cache memory. Um, this would be an alternative approach to the system calculating the optimal shopping tour from first principles where it would perhaps analyze where the vendors are and distances between those vendors. As per the usual EPO approach, the object, objective technical problem must be considered from the perspective of the skilled person in the art in a technical field, not a business analyst. Here, the skilled person can be characterized as an IT expert who has provided knowledge of the first two differences that are part of the technical problem. Uh, this reflects real life, as such a person would be provided with the requirement specification uh, to, to implement in software. The objective technical problem is therefore recast as how to modify the method of D1 uh, to implement in a technically efficient manner the non-technical business concept defined by the differences uh, 1 and 2. These, are, these then become, in effect, business constraints on the technical implementation. So in determining obviousness then, the third difference was determined to have a technical character which could form the basis of a useful, a useful approach to argue in favor of inventive step. So even a minor difference of accessing cache memory to receive some information can form the basis of a useful technical effect, i.e. a clever way of implementing the business scheme. Um, so th arguably here, it would not be a straightforward implementation to make a shortcut to access cache to analyze where similar um, optimal shopping tours have already been provided, and this would be a quicker, more efficient way of uh, achieving the result compared with making those calculations from first principles. Uh, in the end, this case fell down to the presence of another prior art document which showed a closely analogous approach, albeit in the context of travel planning and not shopping. Um, however, the worked example shows how a relatively minor technical implementation detail can serve as a useful avenue to tackle an exam examiner's objection that the claim merely relates to a business scheme. Now, from a drafting perspective, it's important to drill into the detail of how the computer implemented method actually works. A brief discussion of technical implementation that chiefly focuses on data that is transmitted between standardized computing units is, is going to be problematic to get through to grant before the EPO. So as much attention as possible should be given on preparing a solid technical disclosure which describes in detail a technical implementation which has achieved some kind of technical advantage, for example, in increasing computing efficiency. Um, so finally, then, I'll, I'll hand back to Chris to conclude on this section. Thanks, Alvin. Um, I, I think you made a, a really great point that um, the, the analysis for uh, patent-eligible subject matter in the EPO um, is, is you know, now involving really an inventive step analysis, but in the in the U.S. we've got this separate statute, statute 101, uh, section 101 that um, that specifically uh, um, sets forth a hurdle for eligible subject matter. In addition to our obviousness statute, which is section 103. However, despite this distinction, um, at a high level at least, it, it appears that um, there there really is some convergence, as you mentioned um, about. Uh, around the U.S. and the European practice. Um, ultimately, um, there might be a different outcome, but I think the, 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 the test is kind of becoming similar in the two, two jurisdictions. So um, this slide here um, sets forth just real quickly. Supreme Court cases here in the U.S. Um, the, the test says um, is first is the the claim drawn toward an abstract idea, and then second, if so, does the claim include uh, a significant additional innovation? Um, and there have been uh, a significant amount of, of case law in the wake of Alice that uh, that defined the application of this two-part analysis. And in this Enfish example, the Federal Circuit provided clarification and specifically said software is not necessarily abstract. 
So just a quick background on this case, the, the patent in this case is directed toward a logical model for a computer database, and the claim was directed at um, improving the arrangement of data in that database in an arrangement that was different than the prior art and that allowed for faster searching of data and, and more effective data storage. And so the court said that the, the focus of the claims was on improving the functionality of the computer itself. It wasn't just the economic uh, benefit or some sort of task that the computer was performing in its ordinary capacity. Um, it, it, and to kind of tie in with Sullivan's discussion, this is an interesting quote from the Federal Circuit. They say, the claims are directed to a specific implementation to a solution to a problem in the software arts. And that sounds awfully similar to the, the problem-solution approach in, in the EPO. Um, so I do caution you, though, that, um, the, the, the case law that's come down since Alice does have some subjectivity to it, I, I think, if you're, if you're really looking at it. Um, uh, for, for example, uh, for Sullivan's example a few slides ago, um, this, this example, I'm not sure that claim would be eligible in the U.S. Um, uh, under the same uh, rubric that, that Sullivan described. Um, the, the argument could be made that accessing the cache memory is improving the functionality of the computer itself, but I think a contrary argument might carry the day that, um, th that accessing the cache memory is just the, the use of the computer in its ordinary capacity. Um, so, you know, my, my concern is I've, I've got uh, – going the wrong way here. So I've got um, a, th this very last bullet point to compare and contrast with this electric power group case. Um, it, it, in that case, the, the claim was directed toward gathering and analyzing information and then displaying the results. And in that case, the court said that, that this wasn't actually making the computer run faster. It was just using the computer as a tool. Um, and, and so – on Sullivan's example, I, I think it would be a close call, but my concern would be that um, an examiner and, and, and more appropriately an appeal board would, would perhaps find more similarities with this electric power group case um, rather than the Enfish case and, and might uh, hold that example to be uh, not eligible. Uh, but that's just an example of perhaps a fine distinction in, in, in the application of, of these similar tests in the EPO and the, and the USPTO. Um, and some practice pointers, I think Sullivan hit on some of them already. I think the practice pointers are the same for the U.S. and for the EPO. Um, you, you, you really need to focus on the technical problem and the technical solution in your detailed description. On the second bullet point, the more detail, the better. You, you really want to make sure you're talking about um, those general technical improvements and not necessarily just the application-specific improvements, but um, a lot of detail about, about the technical improvements themselves. So that, that concludes our presentation. <clears throat> we are running a, a little over here. We're, we're well past an hour. Um, but uh, we do have one question, so I'll, I'll go through that one. Um, unfortunately, Selvin is not able to, to join us uh, for the question and answer session, but um, th th this one question I'll, uh, I'll answer here. Um, and if you have any more, feel free to send them in now. Um, the, the question is, uh, to avoid intermediate generalization and, and the problem associated with that, uh, paragraph numbers seem awkward and, um, and can, can, uh, can get changed during publication. So what about just including boilerplate saying that the various features can be combined? Um, and um, that's a good point about the paragraph numbers being changed during publication, potentially. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that boilerplate would uh, be quite as effective um, as, as other means. Um, but, you know, you could use a, an identifier of some sort, even if you don't, uh, don't use paragraph numbers themselves. You could use some sort of identifier that you add into the paragraph. Um, and as Sullivan noted in, in his drafting takeaways, you can also take advantage of the, the summary of the invention, whether you call it a summary of the invention or not, uh, for tying those various features together. So um, boilerplate might give you an argument, but I, I think um, in one way or another, um, you, you might want to go one step further than that. Um, and that's the only question out there. So um, I think that, that wraps it up here. Uh, th thank you very much for attending. I hope you found this information useful. Thank you for joining the Bijan Bienemann B2IP webinar. 
Legion Bienemann is a boutique intellectual property law firm based out of Southeast Michigan. Today's webinar recording will be posted to our YouTube channel, to our website, and across all of our social media channels. A follow-up email will be sent out shortly with more information on how to obtain the CLE credit. Once again, thank you for joining us.